Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today's weekly research morning call. We have two stock country updates, right and Vedotronics, followed by the Euro Technical Post and Singapore Weekly. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Helena to present on right. Helena, please. Thank you, Mia. Um, so I'll be doing a Philip on the ground update for right. We had an honor to host right uh, for our company webinar last Friday. Um, right, some Philip client will be familiar to right because we were doing a marketing promotion with them last year. Um, for those of you who may not know Raid, um, they are Singapore's first real-time carpooling app. The company is listed on NYSE with a price of 6.1 US dollars. Um, so Raid op uh, operate in mainly the four categories. I've arranged them in the sequence of their revenue percentage. Um, so for, for the mobility app, um, they have both carpooling and Raid Haley. Um, they're actually the pioneer coupling app in Singapore, the first one in the world, actually. So they do offer real-time on-demand booking, uh, as well as advanced booking. Right Hailing, it's um, the similar functions as other competitors. They have flexibility in choosing the number of seats. They also have real-time on-demand booking, advanced booking. You can also do multi-stop options. Um, for their right ad, it's basically revenue generated through advertising initiatives. And for Right Plus subscription, the revenue is generated from a subscri subscription fee paid by the customers. A subscription usually unlocks benefit, including priority matching, unlimited cashback. There are also some special deals available. And last but not least is the Quick Commerce. Quick Commerce is um their Quick Commerce is called Right Send. So you can think of it as a Grab delivery app. Basically, they help you to deliver items from location A to B, without you physically going. Um, right now, their commerce still occupy a very, very small portion of the company's revenue. They definitely do have plan to expand on it. So on the right, you can see a variety of the different services that they do provide. For the right healing, they have different cars for you to select from, for example, luxury cars or cars that can carry pets. Um, so one question you may ask is, well, there's already multiple players in the industry already. So what can right offer? Next slide, please. Um, so we do have a table of competitive advantages versus competitors. So we can see Gojek is a pretty vanilla app where it only offers private hire, hire while Write and Grab, they offer a chain of all kinds of different services, ranging from carpool to delivery to advertising. Uh, what Write lacks is the payment sector compared to Grab. So Grab is allowed to do buy now, pay later. They also have payment service license. So Write does not have that. Um, so the question become, um, how do they compete with Grab? Um, next slide, please. Um, so right, they do not really position themselves as a company that tries to take all the market share and become a monopoly in the market. They're more of a coming up with an app that works and um, able to coexist with the other apps. So they position themselves as the lowest commission company in the entire industry. So they have a very competitive commission strategy where they offer 0% commission fee for acquisition of private hire and taxi drivers. Um, they will collect a commission fee from the trips fare for carpool drivers. In terms of platform and transaction fee, they also claim they're the lowest. Um, so they do charge platform and transaction fee. They charge it to the riders, not the drivers, on a per trip basis. Um, they also charge cash out fees to drivers, and this is charged based on a per transaction basis. Um, so that is pretty much um, what we cover on right. So um, now I'll pass my time to Dane for the technical post. Thanks, Helena. Good morning, everyone. Uh, now move on to the technicals. So first up, let's take a look at the S&P 500. Uh, currently, it's trading in this uh, range for, for at the moment. Like We are likely to see more sideways consolidation uh, going ahead uh, with immediate resistance at 5,488 to 5,525 area, while support will lie at 5,400 to 5,450 area. Um, next slide, please. So next up for our ETF Monday for June, uh, we titled it Bullish Month Expected for S&P 500, Singapore Equities, as well as Hang Seng Index. So first up, let's take a look at how they, how the different asset classes did in June. Uh, most of them actually uh, pulled back uh, with, with oil, with the notable losers being oil, which was down about 4%, and Bitcoin was down over 11%. Uh, the no whereas for the gainers, uh, the notable gainer was S&P 500, uh, which gained 3.5% to set a uh, new all-time high. Also, in terms of their current trends, uh, S&P 500 and Singapore equities are currently in an uptrend, uh, while U.S. Treasury bonds, gold, and uh, Hang Seng Index are in a rich consolidation. 
and oil and Bitcoin are in a downtrend. For our outlook for July, uh, we expect a bullish month for S&P 500, Singapore equities, as well as Hang Seng Index, while the remaining asset classes could uh, be in a range consolidation. Uh, next slide, please. So first up, looking at the S&P 500 ETF VOO, um, in June, it actually managed to break out of the $490 uh, swing high form in uh, late May. Currently, it's still uh, trading along an uptrend support line. Uh, also, we see a bullish crossover, a fresh bullish crossover in MACD as well. So, uh, well, it's likely that uh, this uh, S&P 500 ETF could continue its bullish momentum to notch uh, new highs in July. Um, next slide. The next one is uh, the Treasury Bond ETF, uh, IEF. So, there was a breakout above the downtrend channel resistance uh, in June, and also it managed to go Go, uh, go back above the $92.60 uh, resistance level. Um, it managed to do a retest of the $94.40 uh, swing high uh, for in March. So with that, uh, I think for now, uh, it managed to break out of this, uh, this downtrend pullback. Uh, but for now, we could expect some sideways consolidation given a retest of the recent resistance. So we could just trade sideways for a while in July. Um, next slide. Okay, the next one is the Go uh, ETF GLDM. So for Go, uh, not much. Uh, it's quite it's quite flat actually in June. Uh, it's down about zero point one percent. Uh, overall, it's still trading in this uh, range consolidation between forty five dollars to about forty eight dollars. So I think uh, with the currently momentum still rather weak on the MACD with a bearish crossover, I think we could expect uh continue some sideways action uh in July. Um, next slide. And next one is the Oil and gas uh, ETF, XOP. So XOP is still currently trading in this uh, downtrend um, channel, highlighted in blue. Uh, also, it, it broke below the support level of $138 uh, in June. So currently, uh, it's quite near a uh, retest of a previous um, horizontal resistance at about, so it broke below uh, 146 sorry. It's currently uh, near the uh, retest of a previous uh, resistance at about 138 to 139 dollars. So with that, uh, the downside could be quite limited. But for now, it's still there's still no uh, bullish signs yet. So with that, uh, we could expect some range consolidation going to July. Um, next slide. The next one is the Bitcoin ETF BITO. So for now, uh, in June it actually pulled back from the bullish track resistance and it's currently nearing a retest of the uptrend support line as well as the flag uh, support area. So with that, uh, we expect some uh, sideways consolidation if it does a re following uh, retest of this uh, conference of the supports uh, in July. Um, next slide. The next one is the Singapore Equities ETF, ES3. So with that, uh, momentum, is still, um, momentum is still looking pretty good. Um, and, kind of, and just this sort of a review of a sideways consolidation in June. So with that, um, we could still see the bullish momentum uh, continuing on uh, in July to actually maybe test uh, $3.47, uh, which is the target area when we take the ascending triangle breakout, uh, a height of about $0.22 cents and project on the breakout level at about $3.25. Yep, uh, next slide. And last but not least is the Hang Seng uh, ETF 2828. So it did continue a bit of a pullback uh, in a uh, continuing way of pullback and sideways consolidation in June from the uptrend channel resistance. Uh, currently, it's at the uh, uptrend channel support as well as near a uh, previous uh, swing high resistance level about 64, 64 Hong Kong dollars about that. So with that, uh, we, we are likely to see a bit of a rebound coming from the confluence supports in July. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So next up, I'll talk about the Thai SDR Monday for June. So we titled it uh, Advanced Info Service and Delta Electronics to lead the way. So first up, looking at their respective performances in June, uh, most of the Thai SDRs were actually in the red. Uh, the biggest decliner was Airports of Thailand, which was down about 11%. Uh, in terms of the, the gainers, we have uh, Advanced Info Service, which was up almost 3%, and Delta Electronics was the top performer, uh, surging close to 13%. In terms of their current trends, uh, most... Of them are currently in a range consolidation with the exception of Airport of Thailand and CPO, uh, which are currently in a downtrend. In terms of our outlook for July, uh, we expect um, some range consolidation for Airports of Thailand, PTT, uh, Gulf Energy, as well as Casicon Bank. Uh, for 
CPO and Xiaomi Cement, we expect uh, price to extend their weakness in July. As for Advanced Info Service and Delta Electronics, we are positive uh, about their performance in July to actually extend their gains uh, from June. Um, next slide. So first, I'm looking at airports of Thailand, uh, the chart. Um, there was a breakdown below the bearish flag <coughs> in June and actually did a retest of the previous, uh, previous uh, swing low support at about uh, 57 to 58 baht level, uh, which was formed in um, November last year. So with that, uh, for now, it actually hit a bit of a support level. So we could see some a little bit of a slight bounce to maybe do a bit of a sideways consolidation. But any rebound will likely be weak with the with this recent uh sound down uh going on for parts of Thailand. Um next slide. Uh next one is a uh, CPO. For now, um there was some uh slight weakness in terms of price action. Um it didn't manage to hold the breakout above a downtrend resistance line breakout. It reverted back to the bearish flag support level. Also, we have a fresh bearish crossover on MBCD as well. So with that. Uh, there's a likelihood that uh price could actually break down this bearish flag in July and trade lower. So that's why we are a bit neg a bit um cautious of the price action going to July. Um, next slide. The next one is the PTT. So for PTT it was uh, a bit of relatively flat in in June. Um, still being resisted along a downtrend resistance line, uh, following a breakdown of the bearish flag. So with that, we could still see price maybe trade a bit of a sideways for now, even that uh. It's, Quite near a uh, support level at about 148 uh baht level. Um next slide. And next up is uh Gulf Energy Development. So for this, um it was unchanged in June. Um uh, so what it did was actually a, a, a bit of a V-shape um in June, where first first of all it dipped towards the downtrend channel support, and then there was a rebound back above to the original price level where we tested the 4140. Um range consolidation, previous range consolidation support, now turn resistance after a breakdown. So in terms of in July, we could still see some sideways consolidation uh, currently in this uh, range, uh, in this current range about 30, um, 37 to 40 baht level. Yeah, next slide. The next one for Casigon Bank, um, initially there was a breakout above the range consolidation resistance of 129 baht level. Uh, however, in the second half of June, uh, it didn't manage to hold and reverted back towards underneath and then did a retest of the downtrend channel resistance breakout. So with that, uh, we could still see a bit of a sideways consolidation for the time being, uh, given that um, this 129 bar level could hold as a resistance. Uh, however, it's unlikely that I think price would break down uh, further. So yeah, maybe some sideways um, in July. Um, next, next slide. The next one is a uh, Siam Cement. Um, I think uh there was a breakdown below the downtrend channel support, and with that, uh, I think price action continues to remain weak. Uh, we could see maybe price going down further in July, maybe towards a retest of the two hundred and ten uh but support level uh previously. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Next one is a uh, Advanced Info Service. So for these are uh, some positive developments. So after a, a prolonged pullback, uh, this the handle of this cup and handle formation, uh, it managed to form a higher low in June, and following which it managed to break out of this break out the handle resistance. So that I think it, uh, if price can clear the highs uh, form in June, we could see uh, uh it going higher towards uh the next resistance level, which is around uh two hundred and sixteen baht level. Yeah. Uh, next slide. And for Delta Electronics, it's also looking positive. Uh, there was a breakout of the downtrend channel resistance in June. <clears throat> and then uh, managed to break above the swing high form in April uh, this year, about 80 baht level. So with that, um, price could continue to ride on the recent momentum towards a uh, retest of the, um, the next resistance level close to about uh, 95 baht level, which was formed uh, just before the start of this year. Um, uh, next slide. Yeah, as for individual counters, first up, we have a technical buy for Tesla at $188.80. Take profit level at $207. Stop loss at $179.60. Uh, last close was $197.88. So for Tesla, um, there was a double bottom formation recently. And then the, resist the resistance to watch out for was 
187 dollars and 50 cents area about there and then uh if the, there was also a ascending triangle build up towards the resistance which shows that buyers were willing to come in higher prices uh which gave a bullish signal and with that uh if price could break out of this resistance is likely to uh go higher towards a retest of 207 dollars and then this uh this 207 dollars um, target level is confluent with the double bottom uh projected target we take the height of the double bottom which is about 19 dollars and project onto a breakout level yeah so um next slide next one is a technical buy for Palo Alto networks at 326 dollars and 80 cents uh take profit levels at 360 dollars and 380 dollars uh stop loss at 312 dollars the last close was 339 dollars and one cents on friday so for Palo Alto um there was there was a cut and handle formation uh into the uh going into the key resistance area at about 324 to 325 dollars uh, level with bullish momentum building up. So with that uh with price managed to break out of it, uh it could hit towards the 360 dollars level first, which was a prior um horizontal support level in February this year, and then followed by 380 dollars, which was the previous all-time high. And then this $380 target level is also confirming the cup and handle projected target when you take the height of the cup and project up to the breakout level at $325. Um, next slide. Then the next one is a, a ISO team. At, uh, we have a technical buy at uh, 0.064 and then take profit level at 0.073, stop loss at 0.060 and the last close was 0.063 on Friday. So for this also, uh, it has been on an uptrend recently, uh, finding support along this uptrend support line. And secondly, uh, it managed to break above the previous resistance of 0 0.056, which has now turned into a support level. Currently uh, holding some resistance at 0 0.064, uh, some range trading going on. But with the strong momentum, I think price, if price can break above this resistance, uh, could head higher towards uh, 0 0.073, the take profit level, which was a swing high form in June of last year. Uh, so uh, next slide. So this is just to summarize the, the three trades initiated for Tesla currently is up about 4.8%. Uh, Palo Alto Networks is up uh 3.7%. As for ISO team is currently down 1.5%. Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, I'll hand over time to Paul to talk about Valleytronics. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks, Zin. Yeah, sorry for the noise. Or something. Yeah, um, so we issued a Valleytronics report, an update trying to be a Call with a uh, mini me, so so call with is a G, uh, list is a private company that does one of the pioneers in one of the pioneers in GPU as a service together with Lambda Labs. So what they do is they take Nvidia GPU chips and then just sell. They will own the chips and then they will just sell it as a service. Um, so, sorry. Uh, I'll move on to to uh. So did. So I'll move on to the update. So Velotronics is, is setting up a joint venture called Trio AI. You have 55% stake. The revenue model is that the joint venture will provide GPU as, as a service where you will charge a fee for compute power and value-added services. So it's, the value-added services, according to them, is they, is to most of the companies may not be able to know how to train the model or, or even have the relevant data so they can actually help manage it. The second part of the revenue will be actually Valetronics will is virtually funding the joint venture. They will acquire the GPUs on the balance sheet and then just let, lease it to the joint venture for 60 months. Uh, I think this the leasing will be probably at cost. Uh, the revenue for this investment is going to be in, uh will not be uh will not be significant. I think they're only investing, you look at the 12 bullet point, maybe 10 million sing. So these are not N NVIDIA GPUs because they're not allowed in so-called China or Hong Kong. So these are going to be uh, GPUs developed in China, but the name was not disclosed. The uh, investments will be 10 million for the GPUs and another 1 million for uh, the joint venture stake. There's also opportunity for manufacturing, uh, but this is nothing to do with the, the joint venture. I think this they will pursue it separately as an investor. Uh, in terms of the partner, the partner is actually quite quite well known. I think they have a quite a large company, it's a two billion, and they have uh, experience in running cloud and also GPU as a service. So for us, we, we do not expect any material impact. Uh, we still think what they're doing is that they are going to explore this uh, initial project, and if it's really and if the response is strong, they were going to uh, announce a much larger uh, investment into it. So for us, we think the near term returns is obviously going to be strong. I mean the the 
there's a shortage of GPU supply and this is going to, to, to going to boost the, the demand uh, or pricing or returns on this. But there's going to be medium-term risk. I think firstly, the medium-term returns will face like any other components. You know, you're going to have technology obsolescence and price deflation, uh, especially if the supply response comes up from, from China manufacturers. So what, what, what we do worry about is that that uh, if they're not careful, you know, a, a client could actually just rent the GPUs then when another better or cheaper alternative comes up, just switch it. So the key for us would be they need to lock in long-term contracts or at least offer a unique value-added services to kind of offset this risk. But in the near term, I think the returns would, be, would, sh would likely be good. I mean, there's a shortage of GPUs in the market right now. Uh, next slide. So I'll just move on to the key macro highlights. So for, for Singapore, we had some, uh, most of the data points coming up from Singapore is rather, f uh, there's growth, but it's sluggish growth. So we did have some industrial production. So this data point is just to help us gauge manufacturing activities in Singapore. Uh, so it's actually growing, but you no know, year to date is virtually flat. So manufacturing in Singapore is actually recovering, but you no know, very modest pace. I know plus three, minus one, minus 0.8. Uh, banking loans is also improving, but again, also still very sluggish. You are lo looking at no minus three percent. Just that last year, the um, last year loans contracted almost five percent, so it's starting to improve. Uh, usually due to business loans and starting to expand. So as uh, as highlighted a few weeks ago, I think the the high freight rates or container rates and the longer lead time to de to deliver goods or transfer goods is actually boosting inventory and working capital needs. So manufacturers have to, will have more inventory in the ships and or, or either have to stock up more and this will require more working capital loans from banks. So, uh, core CPI, uh, so long as it's within range, I think nobody cares, especially for equity market. So it's 3.1%. It's within the MES 2024 average of 2.5, 3.5. So what this means is the MES is likely going to continue their monetary policy, you know, uh, slow, uh, 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 appreciating, but no change in the slope, no change or no gapping up or gapping down. There were some data points in Thailand, so we're beginning to see an improvement in alcohol consumption in Thailand, especially beer is up 18%. And year-to-date is turning positive. Uh, likewise for white liquor. So white liquor, you can, it's actually white liquor rum where you drink it with, 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 uh, with mix it with other... You think, think of it like a vodka equivalent, but then in Thailand or what Thai berry sells is, is made of rum or sugar cane based. So that's also uh, growing strongly. Okay. So in terms of the US numbers, some macro, the why we bring up this thing called personal savings rate is that this is how much uh, US consumers save as a percentage of their household income. So it's pretty weak. It's, it's very low. It's like almost it's like record lows about 3.9 uh, compared to the pre-point banning of 8%. So the worry, at least the macro worry, is that if the US consumer were to start normalizing their savings, then it means they will pull back on consumption. We don't see it right now. Maybe there's a lot of wealth effect because of the strong stock market and so forth. But once that happens, then consumption could actually slow down. Uh, the other key data point was the core PCE inflation that came out, uh, which is you know, within expectations uh, of 2.6. But, uh, but it is still the lowest in 38 months. So lowest in more than three years. At the last time it was this level, uh, the interest rates in the, in the US were still at the zero bound. So, uh, and 2.6 is actually below the Fed's forecast of about 2.8 by year end. Uh, next slide. So, in terms of our technical views, uh, we still think there is one rate cut coming in December. That's our base case. The futures market is pricing in almost two rate cuts or 44 basis points. Um, uh, most of the probabilities are swinging towards a December, 75% probability of a December cut. Uh, in Europe, actually, the ECB narrative is now even two more rate cuts after the June one. So this will, uh, this will be positive for some of the European REITs here. Uh, so we're turning more, more positive on REITs. I think it's an uh, attractive relative bet. So why we say so is that you know, this is the second year since rate hikes occurred since uh, the Fed re started raising rates in March 22. And you know, typically, a uh, REIT will hitch, uh, uh, typically a REIT will hitch their interest rates for three years. So this is already starting to unwind. We're already hitting almost the two and a half year mark. And then usually a REIT will, will hitch up you know, 70% of their interest rate. So by the end of this year, you know, most of their 
the headwind from high interest expense will, will has where you know interest expenses were outpacing rents. So some of the REITs you will see that their interest expense can jump 20%, some jump 30%. And then there's no way for DPU to, to grow. But right now, we think that that is starting to end. You know, as all the hedges unwind, that means they reprice their interest to the... They reprice their low interest rates in the past to the current levels. So, and then, the, and of course, the rate cut can also stimulate you no know, transactions. And so, some of the REITs we still like is like uh, Cromwell because the ECB is is loosening uh, more aggressive. They're paying, um, I think, 8 on 8%. Uh, likewise, for OUE, read almost 8%. And it's an attractive year and also trading at a 50% discount to book. And all, almost 93% of their portfolio is all Singapore assets. And capital land investment will benefit because apart from the transaction activity, you know, if there are more transactions, they also own uh, or have sticks in six uh, REITs, five in Singapore and one in Malaysia. So some of the key events to watch, I think, is uh, you can read uh, on 2nd July, probably tomorrow, you have some commentary from Powell. Uh, it's probably just going to say data dependent again. But uh, the key one will be on Friday, you have payroll. So any so the Ironically, you know, if you see a weak number, it's actually good for the market because a weak number means there's higher likelihood of a Fed cut. Uh, but I know the forecast is about 160,000 uh, new jobs. Uh, this Saturday, we have our usual quarterly strategy presentation. And on the and then on the 11th July, we will have the our US strategy presentation. Uh, feel free to join it. It's open to an, uh, everyone. Next slide. So these are just some of the illustration of the... You can see... For Singapore, this manufacturing activity, you know, is is basically just moving sideways. I mean, generally, if you look at the red and blue line, the chart on the left, is going back to twenty nineteen levels. You know, nothing robust, just, just moving sideways. Uh, the table, the chart on the right is just Singapore bank loans. So it's, it's quite dire. I mean, like twenty twenty three was contracting so badly, but now it's starting to grow, and and this will at least help stabilize the net interest margins. As you no, know, this year interest rates are not climbing as fast as last year. So. But this can actually stabilize uh, net interest income for at least for the banks compared to contracting last year. Uh, next slide. So uh, the other thing, so the, the table, the chart on the left is a bit confusing, but this the red line is basically core inflation, which is the core PCE in inflation. So what the Fed wants is for the red line to hit the green line, but uh, why you see the line uh, rising is that based on the current level of month-on-month -month is and the base effect, it could the my my the risk or the worry I have is that it could actually climb back up. Uh, the other thing is that, but the Fed has a very very dovish Fed, so the the Fed is actually almost like itching or very eager to cut risk. So how you gauge that is that if you look at their own forecast of where inflation is going to be, they're actually very tolerant. They only think that inflation can hit their target or this red line can only hit their target by December twenty six. And from now to then, they are even forecasting about, I think, uh, five rate cuts. So even though the 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 inflation may not need to hit their two percent target, they are already re they are ready to cut five times at least. Uh, and the inflation now at the two point six or two point five seven is actually already below their own targets. So so there is room. I mean, you have a very eager Fed to cut. So that's why we we still think there can be rate cuts this year. Uh, the chart on the right is just to show where interest rate expectations is. So December was this level, then all the REITs got sold off because interest rate expectation rose. So it went from the blue line to the red line. I mean, May, May was the green line, but you can see that, so interest rate expectations are starting to come down a little bit. From December 5% to maybe 49 uh, uh, Next slide. Then, uh, as usual, every month end, we will just run through our model portfolio. We, we were largely flat. So, uh, Telcos did well for us, Singtel, and then it was offset by sell down in Thai Bef. So, Thai Bef got sell, sold down because in Vietnam, the ministry is proposing an increase in alcohol tax until 2030. Uh, next slide. But uh, then this is just a, a snapshot of some of the sectors of what did well. So basically, you know, the, you notice that the finance or where the banks, the market generally move along with where the finance sector is. The strongest has been telcos. Uh, and the one the table on the right is basically the top 10 gainers, 10 losers. It's just a snapshot of the 147 stocks. I mean, these are the more liquid stocks, so that's why we, we, we track. And the gainers is Yoma, Altec, Pan United. The weakness are 17 Life, Orange Petrogas, and so on. 
Uh, the bottom is the STI or SPDR related ones. So the big gainer was Singtel, Yang Chi Chang. The big index losers was Citrum, Tybear, CDL, just for your reference. Uh, next slide. Then this slide is just by asset class. So we take a snapshot of what happened in June. So the best performer in June was NASDAQ, 6%. And these are all in US dollar terms. And NASDAQ this year is still the most stellar performance, up 18%. Uh, the worst performance actually REITs, not, not commodities, is down 2.1. And for the year, REITs are down almost 16% in US dollar terms. The worst performing asset class, I guess. Similar to the bond CTF, I mean, down. So because of uh, delayed interest rate cuts, so I think this is the, the impact of this. Uh, Singapore market on the far left basically just went sideways. Uh, next slide. Uh, then in terms of the the by so, so this is by Asia Pacific. So the best performance are on the top like for this month of Taiwan, India, Korea, South Korea. Uh, the worst is Thai, Thai, uh, Shanghai and again Thailand. Not sure why it's like is uh, after China. I think Thailand's the worst performer, and then we comes to REITs and then Hong Kong. Again, all this just for your reference. Next slide. Then this is my last chart. We, we uh, do get questions on, on valuation. So this is the, the chart on the left is just the, the Singapore market in PE ratio terms. So, uh, so you can see that the PE now is probably about 10 times PE, 10, 11 times PE, and it's at the bottom quartile. So I mean, statistically, I mean, not that it's going to happen, but statistically, anytime it goes below one standard deviation, of course, by default, it should go back to the mean, but it doesn't mean it always does so, but... Uh, then if you the chart on the right, so the PE ratio at least on the left again is at the decade lows as the title suggests. On the right is just to show uh, taking because uh, uh, the valuations can be low, but also you need to take into account the higher interest rate environment. So what we do is that we take earnings yield. That means uh, uh, let's say you earn ten, uh, if the PE ten ty ten times means you're earning a yield earnings yield of ten percent. Then you less off. Let's say interest rates now it's four, so you're getting about six. So this is still uh, cheap compared to historical about five percent or so. Yeah. So this is just again just to taking account interest rates. Also, the Singapore market is cheap, but again it can be cheap for many young many years. But just that set uh, numbers wise now is just cheap on a historical basis. Uh, next slide. Okay. Thanks everyone. Today is very short. So thanks everyone. Uh, we can uh, move on to Q and A. Um, okay, I guess I'll start. So there's a question, uh, what is your view for the US market this week? We should focus on the AI. Still bullish now with NVIDIA correction last week. Um, so John is actually on leave, so I'll be answering on his behalf. Um, we're still pretty optimistic in the US market. Um, pretty much all the tech stock that we cover show pretty healthy growth and earnings. Um, um, there was a huge focus on the AI. So they're either investing heavily on AI or they just came up with um, some really big advancing AI. So overall, we're still pretty optimistic. Um, the reason we think the market has been quite doubtful on Nvidia's share is because um, its share has been skyrocketing for way too much. That's around almost 600% within the last three years. Um, so at some point, people feel like, oh, generative AI-related growth should be already fully priced in. So whenever they see the price start going down, people start panic. It doesn't help that there has been increasing headline about insider transaction and stuff. But we still remain uh, rather optimistic uh, by looking at the company fundamentally. We think it isn't the big red flag that it seemed on the surface. I mean, the stock basically started taking off from the second half of 2023 when the customers start lining up to buy their AI chips. Um, this is, is potentially going to sustain over the next three years as well because NVIDIA has already mentioned that um, they will remain ahead of supply well into the next year. So what that means is that the demand for NVIDIA's AI GPU is so strong that the company is unable to manufacture enough. So um, the people, uh, their clients are still lining up to buy their AI chips. And because their competitors are also unable to fill in the void, NVIDIA right now still commands 60% of the advanced chip packaging capacity, which is uh, required to produce AI chips. Uh, as a result, they continue to dominate the AI chip market with, I think, around 95% of the market share. So we think in the short run, that's not going to change. Whether there's going to be new players coming into the industry, we don't know. But at least for the short run, we still see the demand way ahead of supply. So we're still rather optimistic on that. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. 
I guess then what's that. our target price for Nvidia? Um, I'll I'll check and get back to you. Um. Yeah, I'll pass my time to my colleague first. Darren. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a question on um, the, the US REIT. So what's the latest on Prime US REIT, Manulife, and Capo? Yeah, so, was, so actually basically all three doesn't have or, or didn't have any recent updates for, for the past month. The most recent one is um, Prime US REIT, they, so, they sold off one of their assets in the part of their deleveraging strategy. So that is a uh, one town center. So they sold it uh, under below valuation slightly, but um, they believe it's still beneficial because they get the liquidity and um, they can use it to pay off some debt and to fund capital expenditure. Cause in the US, um, capital expenditure is very important for the properties as um, the, the, it's mostly borne by all, all the landlords. So to attract new tenants, they need to, to make the properties look nicer and, and better amenities and such. So capex is quite important. So that's, that's the latest for Prime. Um, yeah, but the other two, they do not have any updates, but um, for for menu life, I believe they most recently, they part of their deleveraging strategy or rather the recapitalization plan. They have put up some assets for sale, but we we have not seen any good um, uh, take up yet. As uh most likely the 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 banks are still are willing to to finance all these uh, acquisitions. Um, but um the buyers for all these uh office properties. Right now, um, are mainly uh, private buyers like uh, high, highly rich, high net worth individuals or private funds and such. Yeah, so not so much the banks, but there is still a lot of liquidity there. So, so that is for manual life. Uh, capital, oh, no updates. But the biggest thing for Prime is still the outstanding uh, loans, which um, it has buyers in one month. So that accounts for about 60% of the, the uh, loan book, of Prime's loan book. So we are waiting for updates. Yeah, I'm actually trying to get hold of uh, of Prime's IR. So uh, I'll, I'll, uh, hopefully you get some updates uh, next week or by the Singapore Strategy Topics that I can update on, on Prime US Street because it's really running a little close. Um, only one, one, more, one more month before it, uh, the 69% the of the loans expires or is, is uh, yeah, due. Yeah, so that's the latest for, for those uh, three. I think that's all. You want yeah, to hear a question on the chat side? Uh, what's the effect of rate cuts to read fund? Will the income decrease due to lower tenant homeowners? Yeah, so basically what will, what will happen when the rate cuts actually come into play? So basically because uh, uh, the REITs right now, they are hit by higher finance costs. So even though their revenues are growing, the, the higher finance costs will, will eat into the disputable amount. So as rate cuts come into play, um, the REITs will benefit, REITs in general or across the board rather, they'll benefit in um, a couple of ways. So one of it is the immediate rate, rate cut and immediate lower interest rates. So that is one. And uh, rather immediate lower finance cost. And another one is that uh, the spreads, because with um, low interest rates, it's highly likely that the, the 10 year yield or so, or, or the risk free rate will, will come down as well. So as a result, the dividend yield spread, which is basically how much you are being compensated for investing in REITs, like a dividend yield minus the risk free rate, or, or rather the 10 year yield. So when, when you minus off and you take that spread, it will likely increase because of the lower risk free rate. So that's another. And when and with lower interest rates or so, um, it'll be easier, the, like money will be cheaper and it'll be easier to make acquisitions. Yeah, and, and borrowing will be much easier. So of course it's, it's cheaper money. So yeah, these, these are some, some reasons. Um, but the next part of your question is, will the income decrease due to lower tenant homeowners monthly payment? Um, uh, not so. Not not so much as uh REITs basically uh is is not say homeowners is is a, a different thing. So REITs they they 
call it rental payments, but uh, not from homeowners, but from tenants. So, yeah, the the uh collection of of rents will not really be affected by by this homeowners uh, monthly payments. Yeah, yeah. Who that answers that question? Um. Yeah, I think that's all for me. Yeah, head over to my colleagues. Thanks. Uh, maybe I'll take this uh question on the uh OCBC and Great Eastern. So it's asking for minority shareholders, would it be better to sell off sell it off in open market rather than wait for better outcome from OCBC? Risk of suspension is quite high. Yeah, you're you are right with your last statement that the risk of uh, uh the trading to be suspended is quite high. Um firstly, because you know they recently announced that they've really crossed that 90% ownership uh, threshold. So, uh, you know, when they cross that 90%, let me just repeat myself again. So if they cross that 90%, what happens is that the trading will be suspended. But whether or not they will give a better exit offer or, you know, they will do a compulsory acquisition it, or nothing happens, it really depends on how much of the exist, of the minor, of the non, oh, sorry, let me re repeat myself. So it really depends on how much of the shares that they do not own how much do they how much of them do they get right so if it's uh above 75 percent right of the shares that they they, they do not own so they 75 percent of these minority shareholders they accept the offer and as well as they agree to uh, to uh to delist and the trading will be suspended so that's the the key uh fact figure there and also if it's above they own they get 90 more than 90 percent of the minority shareholders then what will happen is that they will do a uh, uh, compulsory uh, uh, acquisition. So that's the one where they don't really have, the shareholders doesn't have a choice. But it seems now that that 90% of the minority shareholders, so it will be around 98% right, of total, is quite uh, low, right? The chance is quite low because there's, uh, I think there's this individual in uh, shareholder, minority shareholder, the Wong, I think it's the Wong family, they, do, they are not willing to let it go. And they have stated in public as well as in news reports, they own around I think two to three percent. So for them to to really say that they're not going to release that means that you know they're not going to you know get that get to the realm where they are going to be able to do a compulsory acquisition, right? So now we're looking at two of the most likely scenarios is that if they are able to get above seventy five percent of their minority shareholders, that's where they can you know just just accept the uh the list plus trading will be suspended, right? Or the second scenario is that they don't manage to get this 75 percent right of the minority shareholders what happened is that it will trading will be suspended but it will not be delisted because they will need to give an exit offer that is uh fair and reasonable and fair and reasonable the range is around 28 dollars 80 cents all the way to 36 dollars so you know you're looking at the low end of around 28 dollars 80 cents so you have to uh, i can't really say whether is it better for you or not because you know it also depends on how long you've been holding Great Eastern share stocks, how much you've bought it in for as well, right? So you really have to depend. So if you are looking, your, your statement is, would it be better to sell off in the open market rather than wait for the better for a better outcome? Uh, now the price of Great Eastern has dipped slightly back to the offer price of $25.60. It's $25.65 now as I'm speaking. So, you know, it, whether or not you sell it off in open market or you accept the offer, it is really quite similar, right? The, the, the price. Or we rather wait. So if you wait, you know, it will take, uh, I think it, for them to give an uh, exit offer, it's a minimum of six months. They can't give it immediately, right? If they don't hit that 75% that mark. So they have to wait about six months. So you also have to see, you know, whether is it worth that wait? It's, you know, if they do give an offer, you'll be fair and reasonable. So we are looking at around maybe... 28 high $28, so $28, $29. That's around a 12 to 13% uh, upside to the current offer price. Uh. But that's a lot of ifs uh, and, and maybes. But just to note that great uh, OCBC did say that their intention with this whole uh, voluntary general offer was to delist Great Eastern, right? So you know if you, you can take that if, if they keep to their word, then it means that they are going, they will have to give an exit offer that is fair and reasonable. Right, but that timeline, you know, of around six months, you want to wait, it might be even longer, 
right? So six months to a year, let's say, is it better? Or if you are willing to just take that $25.60 offer price, sell it off, and then, you know, if you're happy with it. So really dependent on, on how much you bought it at, when you bought it at, uh, how long you've been holding it for. Yeah. But just to put out the different scenarios out there for you to consider, you know, and to make your, your own decision when, when you eventually do come to a decision. Yeah, hope, hope that, that clarifies it for you. Yeah, okay. I think that's uh, all for the for me. I'll hand it over to the rest of my colleagues. Thanks. Hi, I'll take over the ones that are live question. Uh, last week you mentioned about meeting up with one seven life management any updates any discrepancy in your analysis to put up such a high TP of in seven one seven life did it need to revise downward immediately so for MAU ARPPU are not paying ratio uh, for one seven life they are actually maintaining and there's no sign uh, of declining uh yeah and the, uh this is due to their recent initiatives of like uh, launching various campaign yes, to maintain the retention ratio. Yeah, so the best case scenario, we don't really forecast a declining um, revenue. And also, uh, they also like have various initiatives to expand their revenue uh, revenue stream, like the V-Level initiatives. Now they, now they have like 3,000 3, uh, yeah, V-Level scheme for the users, for the streamers. And uh, we will see a profit growth this year. And uh, also like uh, for their cost cutting, as we have mentioned, all the cost cutting has been done. There's like 15 million saving from R&D. Also, they have been actively laying off, um, laying off like stuffs, which is like non non to their current strategy. And they they have also finished their cost cutting, um, like revenue sharing for streamers in Taiwan. Yeah, so uh and for e-commerce, uh it's also doing very well. There's more demand from um cross-border goods. Yeah, and for acquisition uh wise, uh, they said they are actively pursuing acquisition, but um there hasn't been anything like concrete yet uh to announce. Uh, there's a recent MOU, like last Friday. Uh one seven life uh sent MOU with uh Taiwan VC. Yeah, so it's still at the initial stage. Basically, uh, the VC will refer uh, any company which is related to One Seven Life, and also like they are entering into Southeast Asia to One Seven Life. Yeah, so uh, this will like engage them to have like further collaboration. Yeah, and uh, according to my best knowledge, uh, there's I, I didn't find any like discrepancy between my target price and their fundamentals. Uh, yeah, and we also don't plan to revise uh, the TP downwards immediately as uh, they, they don't even have a recent financial updates. Yeah, so probably will it will only happen after we will their um, financial updates, probably in the second half. Yeah, I hope it answers your question. I'll hand over to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, th thanks, Ben. I'll just take, take on some... Um... Oh, so capital limited is down a fair bit lately. Any negative news? What's the next support level? I think the weakness for capital limited after the results. Uh, I think this stock is is really just one more, uh, one more run everyone is waiting for when they start to monetize their assets. So they have like another four billion from the from the asset core, the the, the so called rigs rigs that they that they sold. Uh, sorry, the rigs that they have a stake in, uh, uh, it's become a receivable, it's like a note or loan in, in a way after after they sell. So they're like a vendor financing. So that's $4 billion. So the share price really need to see monetization. Operationally, it's just going to be quite sluggish. And the first quarter results, there wasn't much monetization. So I think that's why the, the, the share price has been has been a bit, uh, has been a bit of a weak uh, and also the other question you know, re regarding Semcorp, uh, Semcorp Industries. So there was another question. Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm just trying to, to find where, where is it. Oh my god. Uh, okay, Semcorp price crashed on Friday again. What's happening? Okay, that one's a bit clearer. So I think Semcorp in their 
the February results briefing, they did mention that the first quarter is going to be weak. So don't don't expect I'm sorry, their first half results is going to be weak. Mainly because I think they have they have two power plants in Singapore that's undergoing um plan maintenance. And then when you have plan maintenance, it's not only just the downtime, you you actually have to buy power from somebody else, hopefully from Capital Corp. Uh, you have to buy power from someone else or from the merchant power from the spot market and then sell it back. So they already high hinted that they're probably going to get a six, 60 million net profit hit on this. So, so don't expect strong numbers in their first half, but I think that's pretty well flagged. I'm not sure why uh, recently the share price dropped, but I thought after the results should have already been reflected. But but that's the main thing. But the if you're coming in as an investor in Semcom Industries, after this sell down, uh, it should should be a good entry point because they locked in. I think they're the only power major power producer apart from Keppel, uh, uh, amongst the three to lock in a lot of that. So most of their contracts, they said like ninety five percent, is already on long term contracts. So of course, long term contracts. The good thing is that you lock in the margin. Of course, bad thing is you, you know uh, it's not going to be stellar profit. So it's going to be very steady, and and that's why they also raise their dividends. Uh, so confidently, I'm not sure the yield. I think the yield is about six percent, if I if I'm not mistaken. But I think the first half could see some correction. Uh, I'm not sure who 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 does it. Who wasn't uh, kind of uh, the hits up was pretty clear. But first half results going to be quite weak. So uh, that could be one of the triggers as we approach nearer. Yeah, it, it will become a very stable dividend yielding stock. I mean, in, in the uh, the yeah. Uh, hi Paul. Genting steadily declining. Uh, though theories on the rise. Any views? Uh, not not nothing. Nothing major. I I think just have to wait for Las Vegas sense. Uh, I think that was the the. I still think second quarter was probably the final quarter they're gonna do well. Then I think everything will normalize. You're still getting a lot of Chinese tourist numbers coming in. Uh, although they're going to be affected by some of the renovation, uh, but. For for me, I think Genting is is still fine. Uh, but you have to watch uh last week uh, Marina Bay Sands when the results come out. That everyone will that will going to obviously drive the the share price. I think it's going to be middle of July. I'm still trying to get the date. I don't have it offhand. But that's something. I mean, if you don't want the shares, you have to really watch when they when Marina Bay Sands release the results because uh when Marina Bay Sands release the results, they actually give a separate data point on. Uh, Las Vegas Sands, sorry. When Las Vegas Sands, the listed Las Vegas Sands uh, announced their results, they will give separate numbers on Marina Bay Sands, which all of us will eyeball to see how Genting will perform. But but nothing major. I think the, the tourist numbers, but I think after this quarter, then I think we'll start, start expecting slower growth really, I think. yeah, Because like the whole tourism is really coming close to, to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, for for Valutronics, how is there any relation with GPU used for AI? Any correlation with NG? Yeah, so it, it is not NVIDIA. It is the same type of of component. It's a GPU graphic processing unit that you you will use to do AI or or large language models, uh, or generative AI. But it's just that it's not NVIDIA's chips. I mean, it's China made in China. I guess like. Huawei is one notable one and a few more names. I actually I'm not very familiar with the whole China manufacturing names, but but it's a similar thing. Like uh they will you know they buy the GPUs, then just rent it out. It's a new it's a new data center business. And the reason why of course the question is why NVIDIA is doing this. So NVIDIA, of course, is very clever. They they are they actually give you a blueprint. So if you want to do data centers, they give you a blueprint like a like a better word, like a dummy's guide of how to do uh, GPU as a service. So that's why even like someone like YTL Power, I mean, I mean, not a well known, not well known data center. I don't think they ever had any data center. They are also able to sell this GPU as a service. Uh, Nvidia will give you the blueprint. All you have to do is just operate it, uh, and then you just run it. And why Nvidia is doing this is just to to kind of uh, reduce the hyperscalers. Uh, so, so their major customers is obvious, is now you know, the Facebook, the hyperscalers like Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. If they don't do this, then eventually Microsoft, uh, uh, Facebook, Amazon, and Google, all these hyperscalers will have stronger. So by doing this, they actually created another pool of customers 
and kind of reduce the bargaining power of these hyperscalers. I think, I think this, uh, of course, it's a really brilliant thing to do. But yeah, that's one of the things. So you have this thing called GPU as a service. It's virtually created by NVIDIA. Uh, okay. Um, Paul, can you give your view, share your view on Citrum with their latest negative news? What are the prospects? I, actually, we're, we're quite positive on... on on, uh, we don't, uh, I'm, I'm quite positive on, on, on Citrum. I, I thought the selling was a bit unfair. I think uh, this operation, they sold down because the local authorities here are going to do further investigations on their Brazilian uh, so-called Bribery case, in inverted comma. But I think their order books just, uh, I don't know, just spiked up 50% overnight uh, with the 11 billion, almost double overnight with the 11 billion from Petrobras, the two FPSOs. And there's another three more. There's another one more. I think this year another two or three more next year. I, I, need, I need to check the the data again. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So actually, I'm I'm quite positive in the near term. I'm kind of not a big fan of Citrum, but I think the sell down was a bit uh, unwarranted. So their order books now is back to the twenty sixteen order books of Keppel Corp, Keppel and Sam uh, Sam Corp Marine combined. And the reason now the order books are larger because you have renewables now. Because in the past, it was all on and gas. Right now, the order books is, I think the split is, I think, 30-70. I, I, I don't have it offhand, but the, the, the difference now, if you do the data which I was tracking, is even bigger than the past, you know, capital and then combined. So actually, the prospects is, is positive. Uh, I will try to do it in the SSP because there, there is a company that actually gives out exact, a Brazilian company that actually tells you how many FPSOs they think is coming out. So they predicted three this year or four, or two already came out, so there should be more. And you notice that Pet, uh, that Capo was, uh, sorry, uh, Citrum was given the contracts immediately after when the operation car wash was settled in the, in Brazil. I mean, it's, it's not a coincidence, obviously. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Hi, Paul. Despite your data of beer liquor sales was up, is that not enough to offset the high liquor tax in Vietnam to justify current price? Any immediate need to downgrade? Yeah. I I, I don't uh, any immediate downgrade revision. Yeah. So so the 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 problem I had for okay. So my uh, my thesis uh, obviously didn't go well, but my thesis was that as a consumer stock with ninety percent market share, they should trade about eighteen times PE or at least uh, 16 times, but now it's heading towards 12 times. So the market is really uh, derating Thai Bev uh, because the the uh, recovery has been slow. So so last year, they were hit exceptionally bad. Uh, I think, as you know, in, in the, the whole Vietnam beer market virtually collapsed. I mean, I'm exaggerating, uh, but right now we see the bounce. But I think it will take some time for the market to re-rate. Not only Thai Bev, but it, like we showed you, the whole Thai market is the worst performer after China. Uh, second... Is the worst performer after China. I mean, it's quite a hard fit to do. But, uh, so, so I think it, we are still positive on it. We still have a buy. We won't change that. That's the, I think the recovery will take time because then it took another knock uh, by this so-called uh, um, liquor tax, which the Thailand, which uh, Vietnam is doing. So how I see the share price, uh, the recovery, I mean, best, best case, the uh, most optimistic case is that you see this recovery uh, definitely in the next quarter results. You definitely see it. Uh, you didn't see it in in the in the most recent quarter because the rebound only started in this quarter. So uh, beer. So you see a rebound in operations. Then, assuming the rate cut happens, then next year you will see the whole restructuring happen. Uh, if they can sell a bit of stake in beer co. Uh, I think last week we talked about it, which they plan to do. Uh, and what was the, yeah uh, uh, and. And that was the and the other share uh, that was the one of the main catalysts that they will probably sell a stick in beer code too. Uh, that was kind of stick. and also maybe try to distribute a bit of phases property. Yeah. So there is a path to higher share price. Just the timing, I'm not sure. So a recovery in beer in Vietnam and Thailand, then liquor also recovering, and of course, hopefully the government stimulus. Then the second catalyst would be a beer co which can only happen next year. This year is almost definitely not going to happen. And of course, uh, some maybe distribution in species of Fraser's property. So there is a path, but uh, probably going to happen only in the fourth quarter onwards because uh, that's only the time when we're going to see the, the, the results and stronger results coming up. Yeah. Okay, I know it's a very long answer, but I mean, that, that's the, the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
Uh, I think I'll, I'll ha hand it up to the rest. I think there, there are others for Meow or Darren and also Glenn, I think. Yeah, thanks. Let me let me just uh take on the this one as a follow-up question for the Great Eastern. So you know it says I may have missed your comments. May I know what percentage of total shareholders still left not accepting the offer? Thanks. Yeah, I didn't mention it uh, in detail earlier. So just uh based on information that we have that was released on uh 26 June. So that's the latest info we have, right? They currently have 90.45%, right? So it's more or less, I think, confirmed that the trading will be suspended, right? But what will happen later, as I mentioned earlier, is dependent on how many of how many more of these uh, uh, minority shareholders actually do accept the offer. So if you look at this currently, right, if 90.45%, it's uh I think around seventeen only seventeen percent of the of the minority shareholders or you know the shares that they do not own that uh, have accepted this offer of twenty five dollars and sixty cents yeah so they still have uh, quite a long ways to go before they reach even that first mark you know that milestone threshold of seventy five percent yeah so it seems like a lot of the uh, of the shareholders are still either you know waiting until the the 12th of July to accept it or they're yeah, just waiting waiting to see if they can really get a better exit offer yeah but, so but in, in, yeah. yeah but in general just to add on to what Glenn said in general the the better the better option is is really not to sell into the the into the share price it's better to take up the offer because I think if you take up the offer you can still entitle yourself to an exit offer because assuming there is, I mean, not saying there is, but if you, of course, right now it's slightly higher than seven cents, but uh, previously it was much higher. But if it's just one, two cents, it might be better for your clients to just go in and accept because then you get the optionality of an exit offer, uh, which Glenn said is about 28, right? At least 28 dollars. But, yeah, but if you sell it now into the share price, then you're not, you're gonna, not going to get entitled to it because for the exit offer. Because exit offer is that uh, th those who accepted, then when there's a higher offer, it will be available for everyone else. So, so I think that is a bit of a clearer thing to do for your clients. Yeah. So, so my worry is that you get the exit offer you're not entitled to because you already sold it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'll take uh, any updates on L rate. Yeah, so for Melan, uh, so roughly the tenant paid two years, uh, termination fee, uh, pre, pre termination fee equivalent to two years of the rental of Building Three Sky Complex Melan. Yeah, but Lenlist <laughs> actually don't plan to use it to top up DPU. Yeah, this is because like the location is prime, uh, and the demand is st still strong, uh, in the surrounding area. And um, so the fee will be mainly used to backfilling the place, and we probably will only see it to be like fully backfilled uh, by the end of next year. And um, so rental reversion will be very high, around like thirty to forty percent. It's just to match up uh, the current market price. And our uh, gem is also having its rental review in October this year, so we probably will see some like rental uplift. They are negotiating about ten percent, but is probably like wouldn't be that high. Yeah, but they're definitely going to be uh, a very like, um, uh, yeah, very good rental upside from there. And uh, they also intend to sell the building, to divest the building, to lower its gearing. Yeah, if uh, there's a very favorable offer. But so far they didn't say like, uh, there is interest, but the price uh, is not very, uh, they don't feel like the price is um very acceptable. So. Yeah, probably we wouldn't see a very uh, near-term divestment from L rate, and for and for some tech rate, uh, what is the risk and reward of investing in some tech risk? A uh, some tech rate, yeah, for some tech, we like it mainly because uh, it's very low, like very cheap, um, price to any of the, it's only around like zero point four times. Yeah, so um, the overseas asset is not doing very good. This is their risk, uh, especially for the office market. 
but we do say like um invest uh, uh, incentives are stabilizing uh, for both like Australia and the UK and also others picking up in this in activities and uh, but still like a transaction is a bit muted uh, in both market so we probably wouldn't say like uh divestment to take place soon uh, for two markets and uh and uh <laughs> it's still like oh, their oversea market exposure uh for their income is only around 20 percent so it wouldn't be like um very significant to the rate and they are also hidden very badly by the interest rate uh, but they're also one of the as rate with the lowest hedging ratio it's only around like 50 percent yeah so like we believe uh, Suntech rate will soon be benefited from the potential rate cut. Yeah, so this is the potential upside for Suntech rate. Yeah, hope it answers your question. I'll hand it over back to my colleagues. Thank you. Also, the question on Alibaba. So Alibaba still have the potential to grow due to a competitor like Pinduoduo. Will I be able to come back? What's a good entry price for Alibaba? Um, Alibaba definitely has been facing a lot of increasing competition in recent years, not just Pinduoduo, there's also um, TikTok owned shops. Um, so one general trend that we're observing e-commerce, not just for the China market, also for US market as well, is that after the COVID period, people, consumers start be becoming more price con conscious. They will really go out of their ways to seek for lower cost product or discount. So this definitely does not help Alibaba because all their competitors are focusing more on the lower cost side. And back in 2021, um, when China's antitrust regulator, they kind of bar Alibaba from offering, like locking in with its merchants with ex exclusive deals or, or use very aggressive loss leading promotions. So that kind of, those restrictions kind of erode in their defense against these aggressive competitors. Um, so their traditional way of dealing with this is they try to move up to the consumer value chain by selling increasingly more premium product like iPhone or like um some jewelry. Uh, but now they kind of they kind of forced to defend that space because they realize uh, just doing that is not enough. They have to go down um to the lower cost market, which has been pinned to a stronghold. Uh, so they have no choice. They have to do that. But of course, by doing that, you kind of risk um, lowering down your margin as well. Um, but if we do look at Alibaba's uh, fundamentals, their growth was decelerating significantly in 2022 and 2023. But in 24, actually, the both revenue and PAMI actually start accelerating again. So this acceleration was driven mostly by the expansion of its overseas e-commerce marketplace, um, like Lovada in Southeast Asia, and then in Turkey. Um, so all these um, help um, accelerating its growth. Um, so I would say it really depends on how they're going to be able to safeguard their market share in the China market and how they're going to be able to stay ahead of their competitors in terms of their overseas expansion. So do know Pinduoduo is also expanding ex uh, aggressively with their team move. Um, so we're going to see how that plays out. Uh, but we don't really cover Alibaba, so I cannot really give a recommendation on what's a good entry price. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I'll pass my time to the rest of my colleagues. Yeah, let me try to take on um uh, which good dividend stock do you recommend in the Singapore market? I'll, I'll take on the REITs portion and perhaps a client can talk about DVS and, and or if there are any others. So so for uh, the dividend stocks, um the, the two REITs that uh are in our absolute 10 portfolio, OUE REIT and Cromwell, Cromwell is paying 10% and uh uh OUE REIT is paying eight uh, percent. So, so those two uh, solid dividend stocks and they're trading at a steep discount to NAV so price to NAV wise. So you read, read is trading at about 0 0.4 times price to NAV. And uh, yeah, their portfolio is also uh, rather resilient. So so these two, um, both Cromwell and OUE, uh, that is a follow-up question, is which are top three. So those two are our top two. And another one I'll add into the three is uh, S Capital and Escort Trust. Because um, they're benefiting from this year, there are a lot of uh, major events like we saw the impact that uh, Taylor Swift had on Singapore. But imagine that um, uh, they, they are, they are so geographically diversified. 
um, Taylor Swift is going to a lot of uh, countries that they have presence in. So basically, they are, they are having the benefit of Taylor Swift grass tour in a lot of their geographies, not only in Singapore. And also the Olympics, the upcoming Olympics. So all this will be a huge boost to their, their uh, ref pie as well. And their uh, master lease a variable rent portion. So they'll benefit from, from those. Yeah, so, so those are our three topics. And um, I think there's one more. Uh, what is happening to CDL? Yeah, they do not have any more exposure. After, I mean, if you're referring to the sincere group, yeah, they already uh, took the impairment loss and they've already divested that. So no more exposure to sincere property group. But for CDL right now, they are still affected by the the property group measures. Like the ABSD, they don't really hurt them because they have some um like Newport residences, they have some really high-end uh, properties or rather high-end projects that uh, rely heavily on a lot of foreign demand. But because of that 60%, we saw that uh, kind of disappear from the market. So the lower end, uh, or rather the mid-tier, like uh, Lumina Grand, so all these are also see seeing um, decent demand. And Lumina Grand, yeah, it's about 74% sold to date. Um, the miss also 62%. And... Uh, yeah, the Busu Grand is also around there, around the sixty percent. So we, we do not see um the uh, sales like uh two three years ago we saw um, a lot of these sales they sold out during the launch, but we, we do not see that going on anymore going forward as well. So yeah, the property development segment is still lagging, but for CDL um at least they have the hospitality segment that's doing uh strong as well. Like uh, with higher room rates and, and yeah, that is just the, the industry higher ref par and such. Yeah, so so that is uh I'll take for CDL, but we do know that CDL um right now they're trading at five thirty something. So that is a sixty over percent discount to our RNAV price of twelve fifty. Yeah, so so um it might be a value play, but we we are still waiting for some catalyst perhaps. Um. Uh, cuts in interest rate that could really help with uh, the, the home ownership and, and demand for for, for uh, these private properties as, as loans are cheaper than perhaps their demand might come back. So they're yeah, still waiting for some catalyst for, for property development sector. Oh yeah, the, the third read was a Capital Land Escort Trust. Okay, I think that's um, all for me. I'll hand over the rest of my colleagues. Okay, thanks. Uh, there, uh, let me just try to clear as many as I can, then we hand it over to Zane. Uh, so, uh, so thanks everyone for waiting uh, because I know you've got a lot of TA questions. Uh, so the latest third quarter or second half outlook for Full Empire and Wilma. I think Full Empire will be quite weak because of the high coffee prices. Uh, like we mentioned before, it probably take some time, a uh, lack, there'll be a lag before they can pass on the higher coffee price. So do expect some weak numbers coming out. For Wilma, it's just going to be quite sluggish. Uh, you, the, without any strength in... Uh, yeah, I was just looking at some of the hawk prices, some of the lifestyle hawk, so that because they sell feed, so, soybean feed, soy meal feed to the, to the hawk market, so that's not also just drifting sideways. So it's going to be just very sluggish. The reason it... The, the results were strong in the second half of last year because of high sugar price, but that was also stabilized. So we're not don't expect anything strong coming up for Wilma. Uh okay. Uh if liquor sales grew, why did Thai best share price fell? Paul, um it is yeah, I think the recovery in liquor is only the last one, two months. And you know, market this stock has been hit quite badly. I mean it's bad news after bad news. So uh, I, I think the market, the market just want to see some better, better set of numbers before they do any re-rating. Yeah, although we do see the better sales, but again, the market just want to see the better numbers. We did see a glimpse of it in beer sales, but you need to see stronger numbers coming on. I think you kind of highlighted that earlier too. For Singpost, uh, why did the share price crash? I don't hear of any particular news as the AGM coming up, but for me, I don't, ex don't expect, I mean, I monitored this stock for a few years Uh. I don't expect any strength in their earnings, mainly because Australia, like we highlighted, is going to be pretty weak. So the Australia logistics business uh, is suffering from the slow economic environment there. 
uh, post will be will be improving, but I don't think there's enough to offset. So there's going to be quite sluggish results coming up, and this share price you just have to hold and just waiting for the whole restructuring, and wait for one pop. So this stock will tend to gap up every once in a while because they also announced recently they're going to do something in Australia. Uh, probably they're going to sell off. I think it's uh famous holdings, which is the courier business that they are looking to sell. Uh, so sorry, uh not not couriers, right? The freight car uh freight forwarding company that they're looking to sell. So <coughs> excuse me. Oh so sorry. So so this stock is basically not just gonna drift down sideways, then you're just gonna wait until some restructuring news and it's just gonna gap up and, and so forth. That's that's how I, I view this stock. Yeah. Uh, what's happening with Shanghai Shang Shipbuilding? Okay, Shanghai Shipbuilding is doing well because container rates this year have tripled from 2,000 to around 6,000. And that is resurrecting uh, demand for container ships. Uh, also, uh, I think this month alone, container freight rates, that means if you're trying to send a container from China to US, it's up about 20% to about $6,600. So that, that is creating a lot of uh, positive sentiment over the whole shipbuilding and container container ship sector, vessels, sector, vessels and so forth. Yeah. Treasury ETS. Uh, which good dividend stocks would you would you recommend? I think for us, uh, I think we will just stick to some of the the reads that was mentioned. Some of the banks that's paying six percent. And uh, I think for the one we prefer the most, of course, is still going to be DBS because I think, like like Glenn has highlighted before, there is probably more upside surprise in dividends for DBS than the rest because the rest have kept their payout ratio to 50%, but not, not uh, DBS. So banks, REITs, and if you want to do more small caps, then like, like uh, uh, even Valuetronics or even, uh, even Semcom Industries too like, after the results because... They, they are, I think, paying around 6% right now. I think the share price dropped. Um, and their earnings is all secure. Right? It's almost back-to-back. -back. So all their power contracts are all back-to-back -back between uh, selling it and also the cost of the of the gas. Okay, I'm trying, just trying to rush. The, um, uh, is there any, any reasons why Nanofilm share price jump up substantially today? Uh, don't see any news. I think for us, we think Nanofilm is going to be quite sluggish. Unless uh, I was looking at Apple share price, usually this stock will move along with Apple share price, but it didn't. So, but I don't think there's any uh, particular strength. Uh, we were initially excited because they were going to secure one new customer, which we think, I mean, they never mentioned, we think it's Samsung. But the problem is, uh, and also is also for one large enclosure, phone enclosure, whereas for, for Apple, I believe they're doing only buttons. But again, that is they are still second source and they're only doing for one model. So it will take some time to ramp up. But again, I'm not, not particularly sure any positive news is coming up for, for Nano. In fact, I thought it's going to be pretty big. But because last year was so bad, of course, the coming second quarter results should be better. Uh, China aviation price seems to be sinking. Are, they, are the tra Chinese traveling offshore? What are the industry stats saying? Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, I should show this more often, but uh, the outbound passenger travels is still uh, well, amazingly strong. I was looking at it. I think it's for a month of me. Uh, uh, this is generally uh, out, uh, international air passenger traffic is up, I think, 150% or 250%. Yeah, about 150%. It's, it's more than trip, more than trip, almost tripling. Uh, yeah, so, so air, air traffic is still going to be strong. Uh, we, we still like China Aviation. Uh, because their associate company, which is the Shanghai Putong uh, Refueling, uh, again, it's like a petrol pump in Shanghai. The profit last year was 30. The normalized profit is 80. Uh, so we still think Shanghai Aviation first half is still going to be very strong earnings coming up. Uh. 50%. And we think we're, this, this stock is probably going to grow 50% by this year. Then then a more steady state in uh, the coming years. But uh, but international traffic in China is still, uh, still extreme. It's skyrocketing. I mean, lack of a better word. But, but just that, you know, these days, all these companies only announce results every six months. So after the results, then it's going to be quiet. Then the share price normally just, just will be sluggish. Uh, what's the news for causing nano shooting? I, I, I do not know of any development, of course. But fundamentally, I mean, based on the last time we kind of met, I guess, uh, it's been quite quite sluggish. Is Netlink a good proxy to buying more read? 
with, with the slowdown in land sales and building condos, what would NetLink's prospects be? Can we maintain the dividends without worrying huge payout? Oh, yeah, I, I think uh, NetLink is viewed like a bond proxy because uh, firstly, NetLink is a very stable business. So they have, I think, 1.4 million households. Or hopefully I get the number right. 1.4 million households that pay them $13 plus every month. So it's a monopoly. Uh, because everyone, every household that need wants fiber broadband needs to pay them. Uh, I mean, we'll pay Singtel, then Singtel will pay them because they're the ones that own the infrastructure. Uh, but I would still prefer a read because read you uh because read you, you still have an underlying asset that can appreciate in value. So for Netlink, I'm not sure if the fiber value can go up, but just that it's less volatile the the payout and. And in a way, right now at the moment, they are still borrowing a little bit of money to pay the dividends. Yeah. So if I had to do compare both, I would still prefer REITs because uh there's an underlying value of the assets. Of course, not every asset is good. I mean, like office asset of US office assets isn't probably became a liability instead of an asset. Yeah. Um so for their prospects, it's still just gonna be stable. I think they are still gonna pay the six percent and then uh, uh, it's only in twenty twenty six. Uh, another two more years, then their the very cheap debt that they got will 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 kind of have to be priced higher. But that's only twenty twenty six. For now, I think it's still going to be good. I think any rate cut, I think uh, there there could be some upside in the share price because it's like a bond proxy, very stable, uh, very stable yield. So they but they you know they grow their dividend maybe two percent or three percent at most. Uh, yeah, so don't expect any growth here. Yeah, yeah, and can they maintain the dividends? Yeah, they, they, they can. I mean, uh, any business trust on paper can maintain the dividends because they can virtually borrow to pay you. Yeah, so so they are not like like because they are dependent on cash available for distribution, which includes capex and loans. Whereas for a read, not just to recollect, a read pays out from the operating virtually operating cash flow. Only. You cannot take it out, but you cannot borrow money and then go pay because you have to take it out from their earnings or at least ninety percent of their earnings. So, so that's why for a business trust, um, most important is look at the gearing levels uh, so that even if they do pay from borrowings, it's sustainable, at least in the near term. Okay, I, I think I handed to Darren the last few, then I think we can go to, to Zane. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, why is uh, digital call reach a best reckoning? Yeah, I don't see any news in the market and any bad stuff hidden that we uncover. So yeah, that one. Yeah, so. Yeah, I I don't know. I'm not aware of any um issues that they have. I mean, the most recent one was that they had some issues with Sistera, but that has been um okay. So it's okay now. So. Yeah, I don't see. Yeah, any bad further bad stuff that will be uncovered soon. Yeah, I think it's more of a, a macro weakness as well because a lot of the reach of share prices so yeah it's, it's down the past uh, few few weeks uh the next one is what do you think of AMC pet read um has it got consistent track record and growth for the yeah uh so AMC pet read they do have some uh, good track record so if I'm not wrong they had many consecutive quarters of um, positive rental reverses for their assets so um yeah, let me just skim through some of my notes to see what I can add. Um yeah, so for the logistics, we expect rental versus to slow because it's been um uh growing double digits for so many quarters, so it's hard to see it keep growing double digits. So if if not it'll go to infinity already. So yeah, now it'll just uh slow to perhaps uh six single digit rental reversions. Um yeah, so but but we'll still expect some positive rental reversions there. And um the demand for logistics still coming from uh, third party logistics and um especially ramp up properties in Singapore. So AMC Pack they have uh, quite a number of ramp up uh, facilities. So um yeah. yeah so I would say um yeah, their portfolio is rather resilient. Um they also have good uh relatively okay track record 
and um yeah they they they, they do have a potential to uh maintain or perhaps uh, slightly grow their their dividend as well I, in my opinion yeah so so that's that's what I, I can comment for for those two shares yeah so uh, i think that's all for me i'll hand over the time to zing uh, for technicals thanks uh, thanks darren uh, I'll, I'll begin with the ea portion let me just share my screen yep so first up is uh nvidia so recently, I think Nvidia uh still uh pulling back. Um, we can see for now uh the previous uh, support level of uh, hundred twenty seven dollars uh acting as a resistance currently. So I think for now uh we still it's still likely that I think price could still remain in this range between one one eight to one two seven currently. So maybe price would come back a little bit lower to test this. This recent low set one one eight again. Then it does a does a bit of range bound. And looking at a bit of longer term, we also have this uh uptrend support line over here where you could do a retest of yeah. So maybe some little some uh little bit of a uh, consolidation might be going on for Nvidia uh, recent. Okay, next up is uh AMD. So AMD uh I think it might be uh, uh trading in this. Uh, this downtrend channel over here right now. Uh, last Friday had a spike. Uh, over here with volume. Uh, similar to this day over here. So I think the key to see whether, uh, it can break out of it is to it must clear this uh, resistance at about hundred and sixty six uh fifty onwards. Then we might see price do uh recovery towards the uh, the next resistance level about hundred and seventy dollars about that. Yeah, but for now it's just trading this channel over here. My okay, next one is uh applied materials. So for applied materials, uh I think a bit similar to Nvidia, the prior this prior level two hundred and thirty eight, uh after the breakdown here here you can see it come a resistance. So price is still and will clear, clear it. So I think for now we might see a bit of a range bound consolidation. Uh, with the recent support level at around two hundred thirty two hundred thirty one dollars. So maybe some range bound. Uh, trading going on uh, for the next few days. Okay, next one is for uh, ARM. So for ARM, um, currently you can see that uh, some positives is that uh, price uh, recovered back above this 162 breakdown level over here. Uh, Make sure hold for three days. So I think if this price can hold, we might see price uh, do a little bit of recovery upwards again to test the resistance and Hundred and seventy four, around hundred and seventy four to hundred and seventy seven. This swing high is again for um. Okay, for Qualcomm. Okay, for Qualcomm, I think uh, it's likely to be in a bit of a range for now. Uh, so after the breakdown of this two hundred and two hundred five, uh, this key support level. Price may do the retest of this prior resistance at 195. So it's likely to be bound between this range between 195 to 205 for time being. I see some range bound consolidation going on. Okay, for Dell, okay, Dell, I think uh there's still some weakness going on uh from this uh this the this recent uh pullback. Uh, because it broke below this 142 level, which was a prior resistance. And then you can see for a few days, price has managed to go past it. So for now, you might still see maybe some consolidation going on, but with this prior resistance likely to act as spot 135. So uh, yeah, maybe similar, maybe some range bound trading, 135 to 142 for time being. Then we also have this, uh, we might do a retest of this uptrend support line as well for Dell. Okay, and next one is uh, Adobe. So Adobe, uh, some 
um, some breakout going on last Thursday above this resistance of 533. Also, uh, so it's entering this, uh, this, it's trying to fill this gap down over here. So I think price could continue to go higher in the near term to uh, test about $170, which was a prior resistance, and uh, fill this gap over here for um, Adobe. I think so is Micron. So I think Micron for now, uh, uh, I think there could be still some further pullback. So for now, it actually we did a retest of this prior resistance at 131 to 132 level. Also, a uh, confirm this uptrend support line. But uh, you can see the volume over here, the sell down is uh is quite is increasing over the past few days, but now price uh hasn't been able to form support at this level. So we might see if the um, if this week it breaks below this, uh, the the lows of last Thursday and Friday, you could see we could see a further pullback towards the next support level at 124, 125 level for Micron. Okay, the next one is for the three local banks. So first, I'll start off with DBS. So for DBS, I think it's still uh range bound for quite some time already. So it's currently just trading between thirty around thirty four. Sorry, 3550 to about 3615, this range over here. So last um towards the end of last week, it did a retest of the highs again, and then there was some slight pullback. So uh for now, let's see whether it's able to form a form a, some support at this this resistance break over here at 3585. You can hold this level, then there might be a chance of a breakout coming soon for DBS. If it does form a higher low over this this resistance area, but for now overall it's still just uh in this consolidation. The next one for UOB uh is uh the stronger bank currently uh since they managed to break above the resistance of uh, around the thirty one dollars level, the price is still trading, uh, at a new high over here. So yeah, for uh for now I think. Slightly to continue its bullish trend over here for the time being, we might still still see a higher high to come with this uh, recent range consolidation breakout. And then for OCBC, uh, similar to DBS, is still uh, in this range currently between uh about fourteen, fourteen fifth fourteen dollars fifteen cents to about uh fourteen dollars sixty cents. So yeah, currently we may still see some resistance if it does a retest of the highs over here. Uh, there may be some consolidation going on uh, for the time being. Okay, next up is uh, Maple Tree Industrial Trust. So I think for now, some, some uh, it did a retest of the previous swing low support over here. So we're about $2.10. So, like, so we uh, could be seeing some rebound currently, but I think overall still still trending downward. So maybe a uh resistance could come in about two two dollars uh fourteen to about two dollars sixteen area um for uh, MIT. Okay, then for Maple Tree Logistics Trust, uh, I think it's still rather range bound, so we might. For now, it did a test of this uh, support at 128. Um, so, but uh, resistance likely to come in at about 131, 132 over here. So, still rather range bound over here, but at a lower range following the recent breakdown below this support level. Uh, then next up is for Wilma. So, Wilma recently, um, I think. I still showing some weakness. Uh, tried to uh break above this three fourteen level, but uh, didn't manage to pull and price came back down again. So with that, I think we are likely to see price do a test of the uh, the support over here at about three oh seven again. There may be some range bound consolidation going on. Uh, but overall, when you look at the bigger picture, uh, yeah, price action wise is still quite weak. Okay, next up is SIA. So SIA, uh, I think uh, it looks bullish. So previously it consolidated in this uh, wedge over here. Then uh, last Thursday, we had expect the volume uh, to actually retest these highs at about 694. 
uh, matching this high volume day. So afterwards, we have this slight pullback going on, uh, maybe to retest this uh, resistance breakout about 65 over there. So I think uh, if price can find support at this at this zone over here, at this price resistance, then I think there's a there's a good chance that price could hit higher uh, following this breakout to maybe go higher towards 710 and above for SIA. And then for sets, I think currently um, looks a bit of a range consolidation might be going on. So some pullback from the highs uh, recently then did a retest of uh, 280, then some bounce. Uh, but I think you see some resistance at this 219 mark, which was a prior support breakdown recently. So I expect some range consolidation for a moment at the moment uh, now for sets. Okay, then for SGX, SGX, I think uh, we could see some weakness in the short term. So because uh, this 955 level prior resistance, uh, following a breakdown and did a retest over here, it, it acted as a resistance and this stretch we are seeing a, a series of lower highs and lower lows being formed. So some slight weakness currently. So I think price could drift slightly lower towards uh, this next 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 area of support, which is around nine thirty to nine thirty eight, uh, for SGX. Okay, next one is uh for Capitaland Escort Trust. That Escort Trust, uh, some, uh, some weakness currently following the breakdown of this range support at 89 cents uh price did a retest of the low uh, this support at 87 cents and some rebound so i think for now the likely is that uh maybe some range consolidation of this resistance at 89 cents uh support wise i think for now should be not much downside because uh we have this this support 86 cents as 87 cents as well so maybe just some sideways uh going on at the moment Sorry, I can't find the, the counter for this CLJ ticker. Maybe you can find it in chat below. Uh, thanks. Uh, next up then for 579 Hong Kong, it's um Beijing Ting Neng Play Energy. So for this, uh currently uh, some pullback going on from the this uh channel resistance. Uh price also breaking below breaking below this support, this uh prior resistance area 190 to 192. Uh, price prior resistance that uh fill the hole as a support. So we might see price uh, continue this this pullback over here, uh for that, uh maybe to retest the next support area between one seventy eight to one eighty one over here. Uh, confluent with this um this channel support as well. So maybe some slight further pullback before we see a bounce. Okay, next up is on uh Full Empire. Okay, for Full Empire, I think uh looks like um how trend is still going on. Uh following the gap up over here, these high volumes, uh there was a sell sell down uh over here, still still resistance at one dollar and five cents. You can see price reverted back to this the one dollar mark. So with that, I think uh price could still head lower towards this 99 cents, this next support level to see whether it holds then uh might do some range consolidation. Or if it doesn't, then we might still see the downtrend continuing on to the next support level at 96 cents. Still no signs of any reversal going on. Okay, next one is Daiwa House Logistic Trust. For Daiwa House, I think nothing much at the moment is uh just range consolidation between 56 and a half cents to 59 cents. Uh, so that is still going on um, at the moment. And for capital DC rate. For capital DC, um, I think it's uh, also a bit of a range consolidation at the moment. So help yeah, between about uh, 177 to 184 over here. So yeah, we might see 
a uh, price we test this resistance again and uh, just uh, continue to trade this range at the moment. Next up is uh, Chevron. So for Chevron, I think uh, price is still, find, still finding resistance along this downtrend resistance line, forming lower highs and lower lows at the moment. So for now, we might see, I think if this trend continues, you might see price continue to revert a little bit lower to test the, this support area at 150, about 152, 154 at the moment. Uh, they might do some bounce again. Okay, for Alibaba, I think price could uh hit still hit lower. So recently the this this key seventy six dollar level, which was a prior strong this prior range resistance, uh after multiple tests, there was a breakdown, middle of June, and price has still remained underneath it. Uh, last week also broke below this seventy three fifty level. So there's, I think price could still head lower towards the next support level, uh, which is closer to about sixty nine fifty seventy dollars. Uh, yeah. Then maybe uh, then then we might see some bounce coming in for Alibaba. Okay. Thanks for clarify C J L U. Okay. C J L U is net link. When that link, I think um I think much at the moment still very uh still very much range bound, uh finding support eighty two cents which was this prior resistance and uh upwards resistance is eighty four and a half cents to eighty five cents yeah, so still remaining this range for now. Okay, next one is uh uh euro. Neff NV. So uh for this counter, I think volume is quite low. So um uh, TA might not be as accurate. Uh so I try. Uh for this currently some recovery back above this breakdown level of the this $16 when price has held above it. So with that, you might see some price uh this price recovery to retest the resistance again at 17. Then probably we, we see some range consolidation going on afterwards. And for GSBD, it's um this Goldman Sachs BDC. So for this also looks like a range range consolidation at the moment. Still, price is still finding resistance from uh this 15, 1535 level. So uh price is pulling back to be likely to do a retest of this key level at uh about $15 again, this breakout level where uh you probably may find some support from over here. Next question is on uh, Guizhou Mountain. Okay, for Guizhou Mountain, I think it's likely good is that we still like to see some of the down, this downtrend continuing on. So there, uh, previously there was a break, as a, there was a range consolidation about 1,550 to 1,720. Then recently there was a breakdown um price price tried to recover over here but still finding resistance from this previous support level at close to um 1490 with that uh looks like price coming down again i think we uh i still will see lower uh lower lows to extend the downtrend for people one so look at the next support next key support might be closer to about um 1,350 to 1,360 area. This was the swing lows made in uh, November 2022. 2022. Yeah. Okay, next one is for CD Group. So CD Group, um, For now, uh, looks a bit like uh, some recovery in the progress. So recently on, on Friday, there was a breakout above this 6170, 6170 level. Then uh, 
I think we will likely to see price approaching the a retest of the this previous breakdown level at 63.30. So over here might be some short-term resistance first, uh, maybe some sideways afterwards. But can, if you can hold this, hold a higher low as well as this breakout, right? Then maybe price, I think price could do a recovery back above to the recent highs and to 65. Yeah, given this, given the current uh some reversal going on at the moment. Okay, then for JP Morgan, I think it's uh looking good as well. Uh recently some recovery in terms of price after this fall, this first breakdown over here, over here at 195, 196 dollars price recovered. And then secondly, also re uh recover above this downtrend resistance line. And on Friday, there was a break above this um, 200 level. So with that, I think price likely to go higher to maybe retest the, um, these highs at close to $206 for JP Morgan. Okay, next up is uh, Wells Fargo. So Wells Fargo, I think for now, um, some range trading going on at the moment at this prior support term resistance level at 59. Uh they are currently doing another retest of the resistance. So for now, um I think it there's it's likely that uh price could uh trade higher after this, breaking through the resistance, uh to maybe test uh, 60 dollars 20 cents again, then followed by 61 30, sorry, 61 dollars and 10 cents. Uh, next as the next resistance for Wells Fargo. Okay, next up is the Verizon. So for Verizon also in a range uh, in a range at the moment. Uh, key resistance forty one sixty price. Uh, looks like he might be doing a a higher low build up over here if he holds the support over here at forty dollars. About forty dollars seventy cents. So if it holds them, if price may should break about this resistance, but I like see a retest of the next highs at about fifty forty two fifty to forty two seventy. Then for AT and T, I think um uh, some bullish, some good price action recently. So, uh, following the retest of this break. Resistance breakout at $70.70 price. Uh, uh, it was a successful retest and price may at $105. So, with that, uh, also breaking above the resistance at $18.90. So, I think price I think price could hit higher towards the next resistance level at um, about $20.40, $20.50 area. And for charter, I think uh looks like still some range consolidation going on. Okay, um uh, near term wise, we have this downtrend resistance line uh holding as a bit likely to hold as resistance close to trend and ten dollars. Then also confirm with this uh this range resistance also at three hundred and five about that. So I think we might see some step pullback for over here currently to continue the range uh from this control of resistances. The next one is on Semcoin Industries. Okay, Semcoin Industries did a retest of this, uh, the key support at around 480. So I think for now, we might see some bounce. We might see a bit of a bounce going on, but uh, I think uh, it's likely to be weak with near-term resistance quite strong at uh, 490, 490 to 495 area. Yeah, so with that, maybe at most some range consolidation at the moment. For Marco Polo Marine, uh, some sell down recently in the high volume. So I think with that price could uh could still hit a little bit lower or almost remain flat. But looking at the longer term perspective, uh, it's nearing a uh, uh it's reverting back to this uh main uptrend channel support area where it has always been finding support, and then uh this is also confirmed the this previous breakout level 
over here at around 0 0.054. Uh, so over here, I think if price test and able to hold a bit of a range, then uh, might be some, might be uh, a good support area over here for Marco Polo. Okay, then capital investment, I think for now, still nothing much. I think it's still, still holding on in a bit of a range at the moment. Yeah, with resistance about uh, 270 and support is about 260 about there. So still quite range bound. Okay, next up is Singtel. Singtel is still uh, very strong. It's doing, maybe doing a bit of a, uh, sideways consolidation at the prior resistance of about 274. So 274 previously was back in 2020. This was a this was a range um this was a range key range support area. So maybe some sideways over here. Uh but if price can continue the, the momentum with a breakout above the recent highs, I think uh price could still head higher towards like the next key level at 285, about there. Okay, next up is Taibev. So Taibev, I think some ex uh, continuing weakness with the break risk, with the breakdown of this range support at 47 cents. So previously it was trading this range between 47 cents to 52 cents about there. Uh, with that, I think it's likely that price can extend its uh, this moment, this recent weakness downwards, uh, maybe towards forty two cents over there, where it, where it was next is the next support level form in, um, form during the COVID lows uh, in March twenty twenty. Okay, next up is uh C -trim. So for C -trim, I think uh Sunny still still looking quite weak. Uh after the breakout of 152, this support level. Um, recently there was also some consolidation going on before a breakdown of 146. Currently is doing a bit of a, doing a retest. Uh so with that, I think might still find some resistance at these levels and uh hit a bit lower. He finds find re uh re rejection from these uh this price support and resistance level. Okay, next up is nano film which uh search today. So I think over, overall it's uh quite bullish today. It looks like a breakout of this bullish flag uh pullback today on the um, volume. So with that uh I think for now it might go on to test the the first resistance level 84 cents about there. Where previously there was this high volume day sell down. Uh, afterwards, I think it's likely to continue its bullish momentum with this bull flag breakout. I think uh next resistance hours to look at will probably be at close to 88 cents and 91 cents thereafter. Okay, next up is the uh, Fraser Logistics and Commercial Trust. For well, this uh still Maybe some range, either some range bound or some weakness still. If resistance from this downtrend is resistance line and price is still below this uh, 90 cent, half cents level, uh, support level. So that I think price could do a retest of the lows and close to 93 cents over here. Then uh, maybe some sideways afterwards. Okay, for Raffles Medical, also quite range at the moment. So it's just trading between about 97 cents to $1.03 about there. So it looks like maybe coming to do a retest of the lows at 97 cents again. Yeah. Okay, next up is um, JD. So what JD also um, was unable to hold Sorry, I was unable to hold this prior resistance of 2730 as a support uh, with a breakdown last Thursday. So with that, I think price could still 
terms I still going to extend is a weakness to to lower levels like about 25 25 to 25 30 as I think support area and then see whether price can form uh can trade sideways afterwards okay the next up is made one and May 20 is still rather range bound, but I think still, uh, still some weakness because uh this $120 level, this, this previous key breakout and then as well as breakdown level continue as a resistance lately. So that price afterwards, price still pulling back. So we're likely to see price uh still maybe hit a bit lower to test uh the support the recent support gain around 107, 108. Uh. $108 about that okay, to continue with a range consolidation. Then for BYD, I think at the moment looks like the uh it still looks one of the better Hong Kong stocks at the moment. Um still still trending upwards. Uh, currently it's just it's doing a range consolidation. So resistance still at around 230 $240 recent, but uh currently still uh after retest of the support 225, 26, 26, still finding support over here. So um I think it's still likely for price to do a bit of bounce over here and test uh, this resistance again to continue to be of a range consolidation. The next up is uh IFAS. So for IFAS, I think uh likelihood is there some consolidation for more at the moment. Um re recent resistance is around the 740 level about there. Uh then price is consolidating between 715 to 740. So maybe I would expect some some uh some sideways movement for the time being. For venture, is that uh, I think venture could, could hit higher. Uh, recently, after this consolidation, uh, price made a higher low over here and then broke out of the resistance at around fourteen dollars twenty cents. So we may, if price managed to go over here, uh, we could see price continue this 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 uh trend to test. About the next resistance at fourteen forty, then followed by fourteen eighty. About that, for venture. Okay, next one is on Samudra shipping. Okay, Samudra shipping. I think uh still looking positive. So after this uh run over here, recently did a rebound consolidation between ninety six and a half cents to one dollar six cents. Uh, and then another bullish sign is that uh price. Broke above this one dollar and three cents resistance. They are retest of the highs over here and still holding. Uh, so I think it looks good for I think it's still possible for price to extend its boot at this uptrend over here. Uh, it's about the height of about ten cents. So if uh if it goes as projected, it might continue to go higher towards like one sixteen, since it's currently at the all time high again. Okay, then for Kili, I think nothing much at the moment. Uh, long term wise, still range bound between about um thirty cents to thirty two cents. So yeah, uh, currently near the near resistance, so we might see a bit of a pullback, uh, some sideways. Okay, this one is a nine eight eight by two. Uh, for by two, I think still still trading downwards over here. Price, uh, yeah. If the if the recent low doesn't hold at eighty five, might still see some continued weakness. Uh, towards maybe like seventy eight, seventy yeah, so about seventy eight next.
0.96.8 JD uh, earlier. 2618 okay, JD logistics. Okay, for JD logistics, I think still some overall still some weakness, but uh currently it's doing a bit of a bounce from this prior resistance of eight eight dollars fifteen cents. So but I expect a bit of a lower high in progress. A bit of lower uh lower high to be registered uh, since it's current training downwards. Uh, with resistance like you come in about if if to its 65 area. Okay, I'll just cover two more in view of time since it's about one already. Uh, city developments. Yeah, with the recent break range breakdown, looks like price could still hit lower. Yeah, trend lower over time. So next key you support area is about five close to four ninety five five dollars, which was a low back. Uh, 2009 for city developments. Then for prop next. Uh, prop next, I think for um, at the moment is still in a bit of a range. So some sideways consolidation, the support of it around the 83 cents mark. So um, if this holds, then we might see some we have rebound over time to test uh, 85 cents, 86 cents, which is the recent breakdown level that, is, that, that has become a resistance. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so that's all for me. Uh, yeah, so the next question is that, uh, it's all a question, is there USDA at 8 to 9? Yeah, there, there is. So feel free to tune in. I'll be sharing more about the US uh, counters tonight. Yeah, so if you're interested, feel free to join. Then, uh, yeah, so unfortunately, I can't, in view of time, I'm able to answer all the TA questions, but feel free to post them inside our Polling Street uh, TA community group. Then I'll, I'll take it from there. Uh, so I'll just hand back the time to Paul to conclude today's session. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Zin. Yeah, so, so thanks, everyone. I think it's really shit the 1 p.m. Uh, and two hours or so. Uh, don't hope to drag this anymore. But anyway, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for your questions. I don't hold up everybody. So uh, feel free to just post any questions that you have. I still see some. So apologies if you can't take it. And then just, no, feel free to just post it in our P3 community and we will try our best to, to reply to you. Uh, again, everyone, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to spend with us and also especially your questions. I uh, hope everyone have a good week ahead and no, feel free to join us in our Singapore strategy this Saturday at 10 a.m. Thank you, everybody, and take care. Bye-bye.